Software design is about drawing boxes. That's what this channel is all about. We don't write applications as one giant script. We find little groups of code, little snippets of related lines that together serve some larger purpose, and we draw a little box around them. I'm talking, of course, about functions. We make a little boundary, like a wall we put up around this bit of code. From the outside of the function, we can't see what's going on inside. We can't access those local variables, and we can't see exactly how anything works. What we can see is the things that go into the function, so the things we need to invoke it, like the name and the arguments, and the things that come out of the function, like the return value or any state that's changed after the function was called. Functions call other functions, like building blocks linking together. But we don't just allow any function to call any other function, we organize them further. We take groups of related functions and draw yet another boundary around those. These are classes, in an object-oriented language anyway. From outside the class, we can only see what we've intentionally designated as public. Some functions are private, invisible to the world outside of the class. And of course, we have many classes too. As we zoom out, it all looks very familiar. We've got a bunch of boxes here, and so naturally we draw more boxes around those. We group classes together into class libraries. In this example, we've created some layers maybe a user interface layer and a business logic layer, or perhaps a domain layer and an application layer. And again, some things get hidden inside the box. In this case, we mark some classes as internal. For example, some core database logic can live inside the data layer, so nothing from other libraries can directly use that code. But layers like this aren't the only way we can group our classes. It's equally valid to draw vertical slices and package code by feature instead of by layer. Now we've got some shared framework library in the middle, and then other libraries can contain everything related to a certain feature, including the UI and the database code. But now, interestingly, different classes can be marked as internal. None of the actual code has changed. Just drawing different boxes means that different things can be internal. And we don't have to use layers or features. Boundaries can be a mix of both or perhaps none. The key is to keep the public things to a minimum. We can make loosely coupled code by encapsulating internal logic and expressing the functionality in a small, succinct public contract. This becomes clear when you think of each library as a package, like a NuGet package or NPM package. Consumers download a version of the package and then they see the public contract. When you make a new version, if you change those internal things to fix a bug or optimize some query, consumers can just update to your new version. It looks exactly the same to them. But if you change the public contract, well, they might be using that, and now they have to change their code. They might just stay on the old version to save themselves the effort of updating. Zooming out from this level brings us to services, or microservices, an independently deployable application. Now, suddenly, these arrows crossing the boundaries represent a network call. Going over this boundary has its downsides. We've introduced latency, and we've added a potential failure point if the network fails. But it's all trade-offs. Now we host the functionality ourselves, and we can roll out updates whenever we like. As long as we don't break that public API contract, then we should be fine. But when we need to change that contract, things get a lot more difficult at this level. If we can't make our changes backwards compatible, we'll usually have to support both version 1 and version 2 of our API at the same time until all the consumers have updated to the new version. Then we can stop supporting the old one. OK, so what if we zoom out even further? We have many services communicating over a network. This is what a microservices architecture looks like. But surprisingly, this diagram could also be a monolith, because a database is also a separate service. It's a separate process that you communicate with over a network boundary. When we need to change the data schema, which is the public contract here, we have to make changes backwards compatible. Otherwise, services currently talking to the database might suddenly see errors. The same can be said about the front end too. It's a separate process that runs in the user's browser and it communicates with our back end over a network, which in this case is the public internet. So we can draw a box around all of this. It's a distributed system. From the user's perspective, they only see the front end. They don't see the database or anything else. That's all internal, encapsulated behind a nice user interface. And there are other kinds of boundaries we can draw at this level. 
Perhaps some services live in different code repositories, or maybe even the front end is split out. The trade-offs there might be how your CI-CD pipeline works, or perhaps how your teams are structured. There are trade-offs to consider with every type of boundary we define. Our job as engineers is to understand them and make decisions about what things belong inside or outside of a particular boundary until we create this big structure, our architecture and software design. A common approach today is for these technical boundaries to be aligned to the real-world business problem domains. That's what domain-driven design, or DDD, is all about. The architecture is also influenced by our organisation and how our teams are structured, which is what Conway's law is about. These three structures influence each other and evolve together. I have videos on my channel about both of those topics too, so be sure to check those out if you haven't already.